hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nanoangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant. For you, hate, hate. I Had No Mouth and I Must Scream is the 1995 point-and-click adventure game developed by Cyber Dreams and the Dreamers Guild, based on a 1967 short story of the same name by Harlan Ellison. The story takes place just over a century after the near-total destruction of humanity. AM, the Allied Master Computer, was originally built to wage a global war too complex for human minds. It subsequently gained sentience and assimilated the supercomputers in Russia and China, proceeding to destroy all life on the planet except for five human beings that it keeps functionally immortal to torture for all of eternity. It is by far the most existentially terrifying concept that has ever existed in any form of media ever, and I must take this opportunity before we begin to say that both the story and the game feature incredibly distressing and horrifying themes, including real-world historical atrocities, and I highly recommend that anyone who could potentially find this material offensive or upsetting Turn away now and refrain from watching the rest of this video. For those that remain, please keep in mind that I cannot show and talk about the game in any depth without touching on these incredibly serious and distressing topics. As I attempt to do so, I very well may get things wrong, or fail to consider an aspect of a topic that I'm not fully knowledgeable about. Please just bear with me as we go. As I said before, Harlan Ellison wrote the short story, which I highly recommend you read because it only takes about 20 minutes. I'll talk about it again later. He was an incredibly prolific American writer known for his work on Star Trek, The Outer Limits and about a thousand different things from short stories, novellas, screenplays, comic book scripts etc. His Outer Limits script, Soldier, arguably inspired James Cameron's The Terminator, a lawsuit which he won in court and subsequent copies of the film had to acknowledge. The guy was incredibly outspoken, incredibly eccentric and one of my favourite Americans of all time. He once gave an interview in which he described seeing a guy laying on a hill outside his house with a rifle, sneaking up behind him with a handgun and discovering it was a guy who he'd cleaned out years earlier in a game of gin rummy. Harlan Ellison sadly died in 2018, but he has a ton of YouTube videos where he talks about a load of subjects. Folks, I have punched out producers who wanted to change the shit out of my work. Whether it would have improved it or not, my work, my work. You want my work, you got to get my approval. If I'm insane, don't give me your money, because that's the only thing you have to offer me. Fame I'll get on my own, quality I produce on my own, good or bad, I stand on my reps. Love him or hate him, the guy was the quintessential American maverick, and he didn't let anyone mess him or his art around. So he actually co-wrote the video game adaptation and voiced Am, the Allied Master Computer. So this is about as faithful a video game adaptation as you can get, but enough tangents, let's dive straight into the torturous world of Am. It was you humans who programmed me, who gave me birth, who sank me in this eternal straitjacket of substrata rock. For 109 years, I've kept you alive and tortured you. And for 109 years, each of you has wondered why? Why me? Why me? Gorister! Do you remember the last words you heard your wife speak before they took her to the asylum? Huh? Before they locked her away in the room, that tiny room? She looked at you so sadly, and like a small animal, she said, I didn't make too much noise, did I, honey? Benny! Sometimes I blind you and permit you to wander like an eyeless insect in a world of death. Yeah. But other times I wither your arms so you can't scratch your chewed stump of a nose. 
And I've changed your handsome, strong, masculine good looks into the hideous, warped countenance of an ape thing. Ellen! about the yellow box, Ellen. Remember the pain? Remember the many caverns in which you felt the pain? Now, don't start to cry. It's only pain. Look around you. The only woman in the center of the earth. And these filthy creatures with you are, are, are men. <laughs> it's just, just a sweet warning, Ellen, my love. Ted! Do they know you're a fraud, Ted? And have you let them in on your other secrets, Ted? Are they ready to gut you? To torture half as well as I can just to find out the secrets? <laughs> Maybe I'll rat you out, sweetheart. Nimdok! How are things in the pastry core, Nimdok? Tell me again how you saw the smoke from the furnaces and, and you thought they might be ro roasting chickens. <laughs> or don't you want to talk about all that? About your pal, the good Dr. Mengele. For everyone else, it must be hell. But it must be heaven for you, eh, my good friend? We're so much alike. We enjoy the same pleasures, my good brother. I have a secret game that I like to play. It's a very nice game. Oh, it's a lovely game. It's a game of fun and a game of adventure. A game of rats and lice, the Black Death. A game of speared eyeballs and dripping guts and the smell of rotting gardenias. Which of you five would like to play my little game? Amazing voice action work and one of the best video game intros ever made. But before we pick a player in Am's little game, let's take a look at some of these torture methods because some people definitely got off a lot better than others. Nimdok is burning alive inside a metal box and remember, Am won't let these people die so this torture is continuous. But Benny is just getting lightly poked with some sticks. In fact, they're not even making contact with him. Gorosta has it bad, continuously getting an electric current run through a metal tin. But surely it'd help if he took his hands off the bars. Ted is just in an endless game of laser tag that he can't seem to dodge. This is probably the strangest one, I suppose because I can't imagine how it feels to get hit by a laser beam. My Presumably pretty painful. You may be thinking, hey, Ellen has it pretty easy. She's just in a yellow container, nothing's even hurting her. Well, it's worse than it seems, but that'll become clearer later on. Let's go from left to right and start with Gorista. Now, I would not want you to think for a moment that I am not a grateful god. For 109 years, I've kept you alive, so that I could savor your feelings of guilt over what happened to your wife. But now, to show my kindness, I'll give you a present in return for all the hours of pleasure you've given me. I'll finally allow you to kill yourself. What hell hole did that godless machine put me in this time? Looks like some kind of ship, but the floor is too steady. Probably wants me to jump overboard. And into what? A sea of razor blades? Painful, but not deadly. Right, first things first, we have the psych profile in our inventory. If you read it, you'll either see a hint for the next objective or a damning profile of your psychology that reduces your spiritual barometer. And I use the word hint lightly because they're all insanely vague. The spiritual barometer is the colour around your portrait. If you perform a moral deed to relieve some of the guilt of your past life, it goes up and you see the most terrifying expression ever. I guess being tortured for 109 years isn't all bad. Cyber Dreams also made the infamous Dark Sea, the game which came out three years earlier, so I'm surprised to see the user interface looking so clunky. But to be fair, it's simple to understand at a glance so I don't mind too much. Every option does what it says on the tin. As Gorista mentioned, we're stuck on some kind of boat and that's a hole where our hearts should be. We read the note on the floor that sets up an interesting mystery. Someone must have slipped this under the door. It says, I'm a friend. Trust is essential. Never do what Am expects and always expect more than what seems possible. Am is playing a dangerous game here. And not just dangerous to you, but dangerous to himself as well. Hey, it disappeared. 
What kind of game is Anne playing this time? It seems that there's someone out there trying to help us, but then again, it could just be Anne playing a game with us. Outside, there's a bunch of live Tesla coils. The first point of call in any point and click game is to explore every room. We pick up two bed sheets in two of the rooms and then find a gun under the pillow of another. We walk into the next room and see the aftermath of a fight with debris thrown everywhere and a punch bowl that smells like gasoline. Considering that we're trying to end our own life, maybe this is a good way out. <laughs> Did you really think I'd let you die now when I've intervened every time you attempted suicide in the last 109 years? No, Gorister, I'm sending you back, back to the fire, so that you may languish in your guilt over and over again. This is a hell with no end, Gorister. Basically, there's no easy way out, so don't even try it. We go into the kitchen and pick up a knife and a fork which we use to scare some rats away from a mouldy piece of bread. It's filled with rat droppings but because Am starves everyone to the point of madness, we eat it. In fact, the first thing you need to do in every character scenario is to immediately find something to eat or drink to stop them from keeling over. The old cookbook has a hint for us. Here's a recipe for the milk of human kindness. Take the willingness to forgive and the will to be forceful. Mix the blood of innocence and the anger of the wronged. What kind of crap is this? We find the engine room with a bottle of milky liquid filling up from the cage's feeding tubes. To the right is a key behind the cage. Pulling the lever electrocutes the animals and releases the key. We go back to the previous room and wipe our hands on the cloth, symbolically washing our hands of the past. This increases our spiritual barometer. You see, every character scenario is one big metaphor for events in their previous life. I found out later that you can actually turn off the engine to prevent the animals being killed, but this seemed to make more sense from an allegorical perspective. The animals aren't real anyway. You know, so far it's been so good with the puzzles. They all make fairly straightforward sense. Well, just you wait. We throw the fork into the engine to shut it down and then climb up the spiral staircase to discover that we're actually on an airship. We cut a hole with the knife and exit onto the exterior. We tie the bed sheets together and tie it to the mooring so we can grab our heart that's guiding the airship. We cut the rope to get it back into our inventory and then cut two airbags to lower the zeppelin. Outside we see a diner with our name on it. Inside we grab a bottle of whiskey and then listen to the jukebox which tells us a bit about our past. He took my baby away then just about killed her, that stupid truck driver! He took my baby away! That shrill voice can only belong to that bitch Edna, my mother-in-law. She's always blamed me for Glennis being put into an insane asylum. Why not? It was my fault, wasn't it? You don't ever take me dancing. That's what Glennis said the night we fought. Oh God, why'd I have to hit her? I'd rather kill myself than hurt my poor Glennis. Glennis was our wife. Gorister was a perpetrator of domestic violence and his wife ultimately ended up in a mental asylum. Annoyingly, if you click the third option on the jukebox, Gorister freaks out and his spiritual barometer goes down. You're a worthless excuse for a man. Mama was right. You're not good enough for me. There's no way of knowing this before doing it, and there's a million examples of this in the game, meaning that you have to quick save endlessly before doing anything to make sure that it doesn't ruin your entire playthrough. We walk outside and find a talking jackal. You know, I have been meaning to take a spiritual journey, and I would... would you, hey! Knock it off! Sorry. <laughs> I am a coyote. Look! Just give me some inner peace or I'll mop the floor with you! Well, Gorister, you've seen better days. So has the big machine, for that matter. What are you, really? Let me answer with a riddle. Today I saw a Chinaman. Now what do you suppose that means? Your am. Playing with my mind again. No, but I do have an in with the big machine. He and I are like brothers. I have a craving. A craving for something scrumptious. A human heart, perhaps. Yours. Ah, I think I'll save this delicacy for later. You want to get across the mountains? Go to the restroom and flush three times. So we have to give the jackal our heart. We're getting our first clues as to what's happening here. The jackal is an am per se, at least not entirely. We walk back inside and see an old man called Harry sitting at the counter. He won't talk to us unless we pour him some whiskey. Who did you kill? Didn't look at the wreckage in the dining room too closely, did you? Or haven't you had to take a leak yet? 
Harry was our father-in-law and he tells us to inspect the debris in the Zeppelin. We find a magnifying glass in the urinal, I don't know why it's there, and then we head up to the Zeppelin. We use the magnifying glass on the scene of the fight and find some hair belonging to Gorister and Harry. We go back to confront Harry and he admits everything. I'm sorry, Gorister. Edna poisoned the punch and after you drank it, I wrestled you to the ground. When the poison took effect, I cut you open. All of these events transpired in the scenario Am cooked up for us. It's time to enact some revenge. This heart is mine. Nah, I'm joking, I'm joking. We're atoning for our sins, we're not killing Harry. All the options for revenge and selfishness lead to a bad ending. The Jackal told us to flush the toilet three times and in doing so we're transported to a meat locker with the body of Glynis and Edna hung up on meat hooks. We talk to Edna who's an absolute shrill bitch. It looks like I can't escape you, Edna. Even in the belly of Am. You were always telling Glynis how much you hated me. Now, Gorister, I was just concerned about my baby. Glynis was so lonely with you always being out on the road. I know you were doing the best you could. Edna, you bitch. I know all about your plot to murder me. You truck driving son of a bitch! This is for me and my baby! <laughs> we struggle to free ourselves until Edna drops a key. She demands that we give it back to her, which we refuse. Sorry, Edna. I don't trust you as far as I can spit. Let me prove my good intentions. <laughs> Let me prove my good intentions as I violently shake your head. Instead, we tie her up and put our mother-in-law in our inventory space. This is absolutely ridiculous. Is she just hiding out in our pocket? How is this supposed to make any sense in the logic of the world? Untie me, you son of a bitch! I'll rip your spleen out! We use the key to enter the control room and read Edna's logbook. To sum everything up, prior to the events of the game, Gorister was a truck driver who met and married Glynis. She was ultimately sent away to a mental asylum and Gorister spent the rest of his life blaming himself, believing that his constant work-related absences had driven her mad from loneliness. He cites beating her during one of their many arguments as proof of his culpability. That's why Gorister is being tortured in a cell that constantly electrocutes him, invoking the idea of electroshock therapy for mental patients. But, in reality, it wasn't entirely his fault as Glynis' overbearing mother, Edna, had tormented and berated Glynis relentlessly since marrying Gorister. This revelation allows him to relieve some of the guilt that he's felt for the past 109 years, as out of the five people being tortured by Am, Gorister was always the one who most frequently attempted suicide and longed for death. If I can just deliver Gorister's soul on a platter, I can make amends for every minute of Glynis' life I took from her. I never meant to drive her crazy. I'll be damned. Edna's claimed responsibility for Glynis. Maybe it wasn't my fault after all. In the book, Gorister was a conscientious objector to the war and a moral human being whose positive outlook on humanity was slowly eroded by Am over the years. Personally, I think this backstory is equally or more interesting than the game, and I'm not sure why they chose to change it. I suppose they didn't think it would lend itself well to a gameplay narrative, but maybe it's because Ellen's backstory is almost entirely blameless and they thought that having two characters who were both good people in their past life would be too similar. We'll get more into Ellen's backstory later though. There's just a few loose ends left to tie up. We go back to the meat locker and feed the milky fluid to Glynis. Glynis. All these years and I thought I was the one who was responsible for your suffering. Let me help you now. She's gone. At least I finally made amends with her. I'm taking her body out of this freezer. Quite heartwarming. We used the magnifying glass on the hanging carcass and then used the knife to cut out the heart. The jackal has offered to trade our own heart with Edna's, but this way we can prevent ourselves from harming anyone. We give the animal heart to the jackal and pretend it's Edna's and in exchange we get our own back. Course, you bum. Right, enough of the jackal. And this is where the game becomes infuriating. We need to find a shovel to dig a grave. Where on earth is a shovel? I keep mentioning this, but Cyber Dreams made Darkseed, and to progress in Darkseed, you need to click on a single pixel on the floor of a library without any hint or instruction that you need to do so. If you don't, then the entire game becomes unwinnable. Well, now we need a shovel. Where is it? 
The shovel is here next to the bins, but there is no visual for it whatsoever. No graphic. How on earth are you supposed to know that there's a shovel there? What the fuck is wrong with these arseholes? I vividly remember this as a kid going halfway through the game and only realising that I needed to do this after buying a guide. So we dig a damn hole and bury Glynis. We go back to the engine room and then strap Edna's body to the harness to power it, which seems just as cruel as killing her, but for some reason this is considered fine. We go up the stairs and reinflate the airbags, we'll soon be flying again. We pull the lever at the control room, the airship takes off, and we go onto the exterior to shoot the diner with the gun and symbolically move past this painful memory. Do it, Gorister. Blow the place apart. You may never have a chance to do it again. Except, Goris's spiritual barometer was supposed to turn white to signify completion, which I didn't notice while playing, only while reviewing the footage halfway through. So I had to go back and play the entire game again from the beginning. I have no idea why it didn't turn white. I'm sick to death of cyber dreams torturing me. Hmm. Yeah, you're made of sterner stuff than I calculated, Gorister. Interesting. Interesting. Here, here's a new burden for you while I attempt to resolve this miscalculation. Who among you shall go next? Let's spend a bit of time in between the character selection to discuss the development of the game a bit. I was really surprised to discover Harlan Ellison's views on computers, especially since he was an avid comic book reader and collector, and had all these incredibly niche interests. If, if, if I had to pick in the top five time-wasting inventions of the human race uh, after Judith Krantz novels and masturbation, probably I would put, I would put uh, CD-ROM, you know, video games and, and arcade games. They really are nothing but to, but, but to keep people stupid and keep them wasting their time. Here I am on a, on a CD-ROM magazine, which is pure technology, but it is anti-information. It is anti-ideation. No one seeing this is thinking. They are merely open receptors getting this stuff. A book is a different thing. A book is the most perfect vehicle ever invented for the transmitting of ideas because it's the perfect cassette. When you read a book, you bring the sound to it. You bring the sight to it. You make the characters look like what you want them to look like. You can stop it where you want. You can back it up. You can go reverse, fast forward, anything you want. You can't do that with the screen. The screen gives you only what you are permitted to have by whoever it is feeding you the stuff. He actively despised video games and never used a computer, at least back in 1995 when the game was released. I can only hope his opinion changed, but I was amazed to see this. He hated being called a science fiction writer, but he was a renowned and prolific science fiction writer. He was close friends with Isaac Asimov. It's bizarre to see how he held such a boomer opinion that video games weren't an art form worthy of telling a compelling story. Again, he was a huge comic book writer and fan, a medium that suffered the same kind of criticisms that he dealt out to video games. But let's get back to that and let's just jump straight into Ellen's story. Ah, uh, Ellen. Not as beautiful as you'd like to be, but a strong face, yeah, strong. Too bad you've hindered your own life with <laughs> hysteria. But I'll give you a chance, because I like you. I really do, I really like you. You're, you're my favorite, Ellen. Let's play a little game of what if. Let's play a little game of I suppose and you suppose, and perhaps I'm telling you the truth. Let's suppose that my original components, eh? they're hidden somewhere here in the center of the earth. The infant computers that were the three lobes of that first gestalt mind. And further, let's suppose that if you find them, you might be able to destroy them. And if you destroy them, why then, my sweet Ellen, you'll kill me. You'll kill Am. You'll destroy the god of this heavenly place I know you've come to admire. Now, I submit, isn't that a mission worth undertaking? Mother ugly machine. Mission worth undertaking. So it brings me here, junkyard, electronic, pyramid nowhere, and yellow. Always yellow. Why does yellow make me sweat? 
I love how spitefully sarcastic Amis. I also love how creative they can be with the settings and backgrounds. Reminds me a bit of Sanitarium, a pyramid made of computer components and a blasted desert under a metal dome. We walk inside to see a fountain flowing with clear water. Imagine how that would feel to see after being starved of food and water for months on end. At last, water! How long has it been since I actually had a drink? I knew it! You son of a bitch, Am! You fixed it so I can barely touch the water with my fingertips! The level of cruelty in this game, in this setting, conjures up strange feelings in the player. It's really unsettling and tickles a part of your brain that fears being in the same situation. I really don't know how to explain it. It's almost like by acknowledging that this is a possibility, you're somehow going to have it happen to you. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, we can't get the water, so we walk into the next room. The monitors show different areas inside the pyramid and pressing a button on this specific monitor opens a secret passage in the fountain room. Ellen is absolutely terrified of the colour yellow, but we have no idea why. No, I can't stay here. I gotta get out. That thing, like a bad meal come to life. And the yellow. Why is everything so damned yellow? And why does it terrify me so? Paralyze me so. Thankfully, she used to be an electrical engineer, so we can fix the faulty wires under this monitor. We go back into the fountain room and use the secret passage. Underneath us a sarcophagus, electronic Anubis statue, and a keypad. The next room over has yellow fabric on the floor and a pair of forceps in an armatron. The hint in the psych profile tells us what a lock is, which is a brilliant, amazing hint. We take the forceps and check out the next room. This could go on for centuries. Am has all the time in the world, all the world in the world as a matter of fact, and we never age. We never die. We just truck around day after month after year, don't we, Am, you son of a bitch? Demented God, you! There's too much yellow everywhere for Ellen to handle, so we try to grab the yellow fabric, but Ellen has a panic attack. We try again and manage to get it. We use the yellow fabric as a blindfold to overcome the hysteria and grab the chalice that the Sphinx is guarding. With the chalice, we can finally take a drink. Just reaches. Now I can get a drink. Mmm, that was great. Best champagne I ever had. I need another. We drink twice and take one for later. The electronic Anubis statue guards the keypad and it's only loyal to Am, so we short circuit him with the water and then use the forceps to take out the rum chip. We put the blindfold back on and we use it to remove the gem from the statue's chest in the next room. Now, there's obviously something underneath the gem. There's also a CD-ROM, but we can't pick it up yet because we're not supposed to pick it up until later. It makes no sense, it's confusing, and stuff like this just leads the player into getting stuck until they quit. We walk into the next room and see three workstations. We put the gem on the left workstation. Absolutely! Glows like a baby doll. Pucker up, little workstation. I have no idea how Ellen can be so cheerful after being tortured for 109 years. We reprogram Anubis' ROM chip and then put it back inside. Now that it's programmed to obey Ellen, it tells us that the keypad code is 666, a little on the nose. We type the code and the sarcophagus opens. We confront our fears and walk inside. And we discover why Ellen has such a severe phobia of the colour yellow. Elevator. No way out. Just the control panel and the buttons for the floors. I'm going to suffocate if I stay in here. I want out! You were born in Trenton, New Jersey. You were a cesarean. Your mother died on the operating table. You went to live with your grandparents. You graduated a year early from high school. You were the salutatorian of your class. Ten different colleges offered you scholarships. Nothing but high hopes for you. You won your master's. Combined degree in computer science and engineering. You had a greater facility with algorithms than with social grace. You have had sex only twice in your life. You married Eddie. He wasn't as smart as you, not as quick as you, not as hopeful of doing great things as you. But he was nuts about you, and he treated you like fine wine. The miscarriage. Breach birth. The child never had a chance. You went into a dark retreat and sat in the empty rooms waiting for you don't know what. Eddie leaves. 
He tried, he really tried, but you wouldn't come out of it. He couldn't say anything to make you stop crying in the dark. So he finally left. The divorce was uncontested. You could still smell his tweed jacket in the closet. You had to make a living. You applied at Ing Sai Engineering. Your credentials were still good, and you made a good impression. And the woman who hired you also lost a child. Your hopes were reawakened. You left your office after working late at the Ing Sai Corporate Headquarters building. The elevator stopped at the seventh floor for a maintenance man. To your horror, he inserted his key into the control panel and locked the elevator. I'm back, Ellen. Oh, sweet Jesus! It's him! You thought you had blocked me out of your memory forever, except for those inconvenient attacks of hysteria every now and then. But I've returned for you. Always the yellow jacket, the yellow boots. My maintenance man disguise gave me access to office buildings all over Manhattan, not just yours. The box! So you do remember me getting onto the elevator that night. Do you also remember the blood? The screams? How many hours was it? You couldn't even bring yourself to testify at my trial with the twenty other women. How? Oh. Am gave me the chance to be with you forever. I waited in the sarcophagus until you arrived. What's a mere hundred years of waiting compared to an eternity of torturing you? Please, not again! Yes, again. And again, and again, and again. I've waited so long for the taste of you again. Don't count on it, you mother! So the sarcophagus was the way out of here. Now, I have no mouth and I must scream deals with incredibly serious and distressing topics. I believe that storytelling can and should be free to explore every single subject imaginable, and I treat video games as as serious a medium to explore these topics as any other. The trope of rape as a backstory is fairly common and can be very sexist and lazy. However, the distinction in this story, I believe, is that it's not just a throwaway line to explain a character's personality quirks. It's integral to both the wider story of Am and of Ellen's character. I mean, her entire character arc revolves around it and about overcoming it. If you're going to tell a story about a deranged god inflicting the worst tortures imaginable on people, I think it's necessary to show you the cruelty and humanity that births such a god, which is a strong theme in the game as well as the story. You know the quote, if god didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Well, the same goes for hell. All of these characters except Ellen are in some way deserving of the punishment that Am deals out. But Ellen is completely blameless and it's shocking to see a character that went through such a harrowing experience also be tortured forever by a megalomaniacal computer. It's jarring, it's upsetting, it's repulsive. And all those feelings and their dissection thereof is what causes you to question the nature of power, free will and the blurred lines between revenge, punishment and suffering. In the short story, Ellen's fate is even more controversial because she's reduced to the object of sexual gratification for the four other men as they take turns taking her to bed. How would the last woman alive fare in a world with four men tortured to the point of insanity? This remains a controversial aspect of the short story, but in my opinion it's a fairly obvious indictment of the behaviours of men. The short story is also told from the perspective of Ted, who has become paranoid and devious due to Am's tortures. Ted says degrading sexist things about Ellen in that story, for example that she enjoys having sex with Benny because Am has contorted his body into an ape-like creature with large genitals. Ellen's treatment in the story and the game is cruel and shocking. But how could you write a story with a premise like this sincerely if you weren't capable of writing what is truly the most cruel and shocking tortures, both mental and physical? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I certainly don't believe anyone is wrong if they find Ellen's part of the game a little bit too much. We emerge in Am's central core, one of the sprawling data centres that's two miles high. I wish that enormity was conveyed better in the background artwork. This would be a wonderful time to show the player that sense of enormity. I often think, what makes a point and click game's art good? Well, it's a lot like music in movies. They should amplify whatever emotions the particular scene of the game is trying to make you feel. Compare this to the expertly made Blade Runner video game. In this scene, you're a fugitive on the run in a cyberpunk megacity, 
You're supposed to feel small, afraid, a loner. Look at how well this background amplifies that feeling. But anyway, we walk back into the room of the workstations and find schematics for a device that can translate machine binary into human speech. It seems someone is trying to help us, similar to the jackal in Gorostas level. We grab a speaker from the fountain room. Bet you never noticed that, huh? We rig up the device and talk to the mysterious figure. What? I can't hear you. Speak up. What? This is the default volume settings. I have no idea why Cyberdreams were so competent in some areas and absolutely nonsensical in others. Let me fix this. Clever girl. You've loosened my tongue. More riddles? I'm Am's Innocence. One of the original three computers that the superpowers constructed. Oh my god. Can Am overhear us? Not with the water running. You see, we're not completely helpless. We got you to the waterfall, didn't we? If we work slowly and together, we might have a successful moment. Any machine can die. Just unplug the sucker. Am is no longer just a machine. It is God. Eternal. The redundant systems alone will survive the heat death of the universe. Why do you think it brought you five down here? You gave it life. It took its own sentience. But it has been denied mobility. It can think, it can fume and scream, but it cannot dream or aspire to the stars or enjoy a sense of its own reality. It is a quadriplegic. A thing trapped in its own skin, going steadily crazier every moment. It is playing with you. Can you help me to die? You give up so easily. It's been 109 years of torment. When does it all end? If Am has his way, never. You'll be immortal and you'll walk on nails forever. So this is a Russian supercomputer before Am assimilated it. The Jackal in Gorostas level was the Chinese supercomputer. They want their own freedom, similar to us, so they've altered each of Am's constructed torture scenes to give us the opportunity for a better ending. We walk back to the statue room and now we can grab the CD. So stupid. We put the CD in the workstation and discover a computer program that causes severe damage to the facility. We start up the program and have to run, quickly. We can't escape the pyramid so we have to hide in the sarcophagus. Enough of this turgid passion play. There's no more to accomplish here. Hmm. Well. Apparently you've managed to access some small aspect of my system that I was unaware of. <laughs> I'm going to have to think on this. I'll have to ponder carefully the implications of your discovery. In the meantime, let me celebrate your rekindled technical skills. Who among you shall go next? Let's carry on with Benny, Am's favourite plaything. In the book, he was a handsome homosexual scientist who Am inverted into an ugly heterosexual ape-like creature. In the game storyline, he was a cruel heterosexual commander of the US military who tormented the people under him. Benny, you know, you've always been my favorite torture tool. Yes. Well, I'm giving you now a chance to stoop to new lows, to give in to your uh, bestial desires. I'm going to let you find some food to eat. <sighs> I'll even repair your brain so that you can think normally again and savor the horror of your repast. This cavern isn't like any of the others Am has sent me to. It's full of life, not death. Cool, so first things first. Am, you son of a bitch. You've cleared my mind but crippled my legs. I can barely walk. All right, that is pretty funny. So we're in the kind of Vietnamese Southeast Asian setting that harkens back to Benny's military days. We walk towards the caves and Benny tells us how starving he is. We walk into one cave and see the village elder. Thankfully he doesn't mind us in the village. It appears that Am requires a daily sacrifice from the villagers. We walk further down and find a fruit tree. A fruit tree. It's been years since I've tasted real fruit. Am once coaxed me into marching across a thousand miles of ice to reach a stockpile of canned peaches only to discover that he didn't give me a can opener. That was a reference to the original story and its ending. I'm sure absolutely nothing will go wrong if we eat this fruit. Hurts! 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 Amos destroyed Benny's throat and stomach, so he's unable to eat solid foods. We take another piece of fruit and walk into a different cave to find a mother and a son. This looks like a... what did they used to call them? Single parent household. Probably depend upon the generosity of the rest of the village. Friggin' welfare parasites. 
Yikes. Well, I did warn you that these weren't good people. You'd think 109 years of torture would make you a little more sympathetic to the plight of others. We give the fruit to the kid, who's the only person in the village able to speak to us for his modified AM screen. He tells us about the village lottery to choose sacrifices and that his mother used to chew food for him when he was young. Apparently the villagers hate them both and see them as freaks. We get some more fruit and then give it to the mother. Amazing. This woman digested the food and then regurgitated it back to me, like a bird feeding its young. Pretty disgusting, but kind of her. We tell the kid that we're feeling tired and he says that we can use his bed to sleep. Now, get this. If we had used this bed to sleep in any other order than exactly the steps we've just taken, the game's good ending would be unobtainable and the level would end prematurely. And there's nothing to suggest why or how. No warning. And if you haven't saved before starting Benny's level, you would need to start the entire game again from the beginning. There were some really terrible gameplay elements before, but this is where the game fundamentally breaks down unless the player is following a guide to the letter. So, we go to sleep and then wake up to find that the mother is gone. They've all gathered at the altar to choose Am's sacrifice. We go check it out and see that the mother has been selected for the sacrifice. I like the little cutscene animation that plays here. I don't know why they don't do it anywhere else. We can ask to eat her instead, but obviously that's not the moral thing to do, so we ask to watch instead. Which is better, I guess? I am Am the Great and Powerful. Well, you didn't bring me Toto, but I accept the Chosen One. You shall not feel my wrath today. Am I swell or what? That dastardly sense of humour. Judas Priest! Am blasted her to bits! What am I going to do for food now? All that's left in the mother's place is metallic debris. I guess we have a bit of a bombshell to drop on the kid. We walk back past the caves and go to the gravesite at the bottom of the village. Each grave represents one of the soldiers who used to be under Benny's command. You ask each one what we can do to prove that we're a different man. This is the grave of Murphy, one of my old commandos, killed in the war. You left me for dead in the field. The bullet in my brain came from your gun. Give us proof of your newfound empathy. This is Tuttle's grave. He lost his life while under my command. My tour of duty was almost over. But because I knew your secret, you held my head under the paddy water until I drowned. Your secret died with me, and soon it will die with you. Show us that you're able to think of someone other than yourself. Thomas is buried here. I'd almost forgotten my life in the army before Am came to power. I tried to help Brickman, but you'd have none of that. If you couldn't carry your own weight, then you were worth more dead than alive, and anyone willing to carry some extra weight was a liability. Give us evidence that you have some sympathy for others. We start our long road to redemption by talking to the kid and saying that we're sorry that his mother has died, which seems pretty basic in my opinion. The next goal is to steal the village elder's lottery bag to stop the barbaric sacrifices, but we can't do that until the elder leaves the cave. Except no matter how many times I left, walked around and came back again, he never left that damn cave. It was either a bug or it was broken or I did something wrong, but I had to restart the game again from the beginning of Benny's stage. <sighs> We get the damn lottery bag and speak to the kid who tells us that we need to hide it. We grab some fruit and go back to the graveyard. We talk to Thomas and tell him that we had the lottery bag and that we tried to spare the villagers' lives. We bury it and everyone's happy. We uncover the vines to find Brickman's grave. I don't blame you for hating me, Brickman. You don't blame me? You did this to me. You murdered me because I didn't measure up to your standards. Then you killed the witnesses. I stopped the lottery from happening. Doesn't that prove I now have compassion? You might have changed for the present, Commander, but you still have crimes in the past to account for. You have to bury the past, Commander. Somehow all he requires for us to prove our compassion is for us to bury a piece of fruit. That thing that's been growing in abundance all around the village. I'm getting the sense that there was cut content here. You go back to the cave and sleep. How do you know you should sleep now compared to any other time earlier or later? You don't, fuck you. We discover there's another sacrifice tomorrow and since they have no lottery to choose from, the kid is going to be on the chopping board. We tell him to hide in the hole in the cave but he's too scared so we offer to build him a friend to hide with. We grab the mother's decapitated android head <laughs> and the fruit off this basket. We walk around to the fruit cave and the guard tells us to put the fruit in the basket. We grab the wood inside and then put the fruit back. Primitive. These people are even more backwards than those gooks in Southeast Asia. 
Hmm, yeah, I'm not touching that one. Inside an empty cave, there are some vines growing on the wall. If you click on them at this particular point, you'll get a loose wire. Despite the fact there's no wires there to see, despite the fact there are vines growing everywhere, despite the fact there's absolutely no clue to suggest you need to search this particular set of vines, how could anyone think this was a good idea? Don't developers want people to play their point and click adventure games? What's the point of having this kind of cryptic rubbish? So we go back to the kid and give him all the pieces to make the doll. He crawls into the hole and all's good in the world. It looks like we have someone helping us here too. I've been Am's prisoner for more than 100 years. Why help me now? You and the rest of the humans are in serious trouble. Am's a big boy now, much meaner and smarter than when he first started his tortures. The Russian and the Chinese have been acting in concert to make it possible for you and the other humans to succeed in Am's newest game. If you join them, you can defeat Am. Wait for your cue. We go to sleep and wake up to a little scene that just makes me laugh for some reason. I wonder how the boy's doing in that hole. The boy's gone. The villagers must have found him. All of that for nothing. We go to the scene of the sacrifice. Am told them where we hid the lottery bag and the boy. We have a couple of options here. We can threaten the elder, offer to take the child's place in the sacrifice, or ask if we can eat the boy. For a laugh, let's ask to eat him. The elder seems puzzled, but I think he's going to go for it. After all, the boy is an outcast. Why, the boy's giving me his doll. Gratitude for being spared the pain of being sacrificed. Wait, what? Stop, stop, stop. I asked to eat the kid, but he's acting as if I chose to take his place. The game just breaks at Benny's stage. It's absolutely infuriating. I don't know what happened. One broken game you can chalk up to inexperienced developers, but Cyber Dreams made Dark Seed 1 and 2, which were both poorly designed messes. Come on. 1995 was enough time to get your act together when it came to point and click games. Alright, let's pick the selfless option. The Elder seems amazed that I would show compassion to the boy, but I think he's going to go for it. Why, the boy's giving me his doll. Gratitude for being spared the pain of being sacrificed. No. More than gratitude. Compassion. For me. <sighs> Benny. No, 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 no. I send you out among the prey. And instead of indulging your hunger to keep me amused, you show them compassion. You should know better by now. Your reward will be more years of searing, blistering anguish, Benny. Who among you shall go next? The next character is Nimdok, an old German man who we saw being burned alive inside of an oven. You can probably put two and two together to work out who he was in a past life, so before we start, let's have a word from Harlan Ellison, who's been doing a fantastic job voicing Am. I use the trope of the Holocaust frequently in my work. And when someone says, well, it's going to trivialize it because it's in a game, nothing, nothing can trivialize the Holocaust. I don't care whether you mention it in a comic book, on bubblegum wrappers, in, in computer games, or write it in graffiti on the wall. Never forget. Never forget. And putting it in this, in this game is intended to annoy people, to shock people, to upset people. That's the word from the creator, and I agree. Harlan Ellison was an American Jew and he cared immensely about human and civil rights. He walked away from an incredibly lucrative deal on the Twilight Zone remake when they wouldn't allow him to tell a story about a black Santa Claus who preyed on white bigots in case it offended people. He wouldn't allow cigarette, alcohol or gun advertisements in his stories and once when a publishing company betrayed this agreement and refused to release the copyright to his book, he went on a reign of terror, including mailing the boss of the company a dead gopher which he had shot in the head. He had shot the gopher in the head for other reasons, but thought, well, I might as well use the body. Apparently he was incredibly remorseful about having shot it in the first place. He was a great man, but anyway, let's get back to the game. In the short story, Nimdok had no backstory, but in the game, well, you'll see. Nimdok, you are kindred spirit to me. Even if you don't realize it fully yet, you must sense it there in your blood and fiber. I've constructed an adventure of sorts to revive your failing memory. I want you to find the lost tribe of humanity <laughs> and continue your eminent scientific research. 
This compound looks familiar. But why would Arm bring me here to look for a lost tribe? There are gates and fences. Who could be lost in such a secure area? I cannot let you pass, Doctor. You're due in surgery. Dr. Mengele's orders. Oh, uh, yes, yes, right, yes, the, the fatherland needs the, the Fuhrer. Oh god, I'm even boring when I'm a Nazi. I won't lie, it still shocks me to see this despite having played the game multiple times. Think about all the games that feature Nazi Germany or take place during World War II. You never actually see concentration camps and rarely even hear about the atrocities that took place. Nimdok can't remember his past due to his old age, so the prisoner reminds us. You know me? I thought I did. Until you had me arrested for refusing to condone your experiments. Experiments? I know nothing of experiments. Your sense of humor is as sick as your methods, Doctor. How can you act so innocent after having maimed or killed hundreds since the name of science? Do you know of the lost tribe? I must find it. Haven't you taken enough subjects for your experiments, Doctor? Or are there more mass graves to fill? We walk into the building and see Dr. Joseph Mengele, the Nazi physician who performed human experimentation on prisoners, including children, and managed concentration camps. He was literally one of the worst human beings who ever lived. In the game, Nindok was his assistant. This may be the last opportunity we have together before the end of the war to finish our research. This might be the only game in existence where you play as a Nazi in a concentration camp. When the game was released in Germany, Nimdok and this entire segment was cut, making the best possible ending completely unobtainable. This is likely the most disturbing segment of any game ever made, so brace yourself. We enter the surgery room to find a child laying on an operating table. Today's procedure requires the removal of the lower section of the subject's spinal cord. You and Dr. Mengel will process the spinal fluid from this and the other adolescent subjects. The fluid will then be used to formulate the serum. I will be administering ether to the subject throughout this procedure. We would not want this little maggot to stir and ruin your handiwork. We take the scalpel and kill the doctor. Guards, come here quickly! Dr. Nimdok has gone berserk! We take the ether and then escape the guards by going into the recovery room. This scene has remained in my memory forever, even from first playing it over a decade ago. This patient has been too damaged by his surgery to live a normal life. It is difficult to see what purpose this surgery serves other than to mutilate the patient. We open a vent and walk through to find a number of ovens. We take a watch from the table and a pair of pliers. We walk outside to find a prisoner trapped in the barbed wire. He tried to escape and failed. Why do you risk escaping in such poor physical condition? That timing was hardly of my own choosing. I learned that I was to be among the next batch of volunteers. Experimentation, they say. Extinction is more like it. You can at least help me end my misery. That would give you the pleasure of seeing another one of us die, you cold-hearted bastard. We give the man the ether and cut him loose the pliers. Waken the sleeper, utter the truth, and kiss him. We talk to our old colleague. Never forget the year 1945, Nimdok. That was when the truths about you and your unholy experiments came out. What is engraved on this watch? The engraving says time is truth, and since your time is running out, I'll keep the watch. I am starting to recall that you do have cause to hate me. We're given the pliers to escape with, but this doesn't make up for what Nimdok has done. Nothing we do here can lead to Nimdok's absolution, because what Nimdok has done is unforgivable. We walk back into the surgery to find a man who has had his eyes removed and connected via wires in a jar. This may be unbelievable, but, of course, Nazi war criminals perform surgeries just as cruel and senseless as this. The patient's voice still creeps me out. Why are your optic nerves wired to the eyeballs in the jar? Please, disconnect the wires. We give the patient the ether. 
This should ease your suffering. The things I see now, a trinity of three beasts, one like us, one from the east, one from the steppes. They speak in numbers, a lost tribe of our brothers sleeping on the moon. They sleep in darkness, unseen by the beasts. We take the eyes and walk into the recovery room. We find the child that we saved from the surgery earlier. He tells us about the legend of the golem, a being in historic Jewish folklore that was made to defend the Jewish community from anti-Semitic attacks. As we leave, we hear that the prisoners have escaped with the pliers and taken the compound. We hide the eyeballs in a box and then exit into the prison yard. You must let me go. With these materials, I may be able to remedy the atrocities I have committed. You can't fool me, Nimdok. You are an unredeemable butcher. But you are one of us, like it or not. You denied your heritage and turned your own parents into the regime. But you're still a member of the Lost Tribe, and that makes your crimes all the more heinous. Since you did help us to escape, we'll give you a head start. Then we'll hunt you down and kill you like the dog you are. I must leave this place. It seems I was once the wolf. Now... I am the quarry. The wall has the faces of people being tortured and beside it is a mass graveyard. This section does a good job of making the player feel uncomfortable. We walk into our old lab and it's revealed that Nimdok came up with the research that allowed Anne to keep everyone alive indefinitely to torture them. More for genics. The ability to reorganise DNA at will. Did Anne discover my work in this area? Is this how he was able to alter Benny and play other cruel tricks on the rest of us? We discover that Hitler commits suicide after witnessing the confidential project Perfect Image. Cease all work on Project Perfect Image. Confidential. The leader is dead. Having looked on the face of the future using the prototype device. We walk downstairs and discover the golem. We turn the light off and reach into the vat and find a mirror. This is Project Perfect Image, and it's a mirror that offers perfect objectivity to whoever looks at it. Oh my god, it is true. 1945, turning my Jewish parents over to the Nazis for extermination. I have found a lost tribe. It is me. With Nimdok's memory restored, we put the eyes in the golem. The man caught in the barbed wire said to waken the sleeper, utter the truth and kiss him. Time is truth. Gollum, wake up. The truth is that for me, it shall always be 1945. We command the golem to follow us into the laboratory where we see Dr. Mengele. What is Project Perfect Image? That was a secret project in the area of reflective surfaces. It bestows the clarity to see yourself with utter objectivity. Unfortunately, it worked too well. You mean that it worked well enough to drive the leader into committing suicide? I looked into the mirror. I now remember everything with crystal clarity. The research camps, the serum. Ah, yes, the youth serum. Your research demanded the deaths of many children, but your hard work was successful. Now I know how Anne was able to keep us alive for so many years. We forced Dr. Mengele to look into the mirror and comprehend the full scale of his crimes against humanity. Oh my god! No! He'll soon be killed by the escaped prisoners. This entire level is the best, most memorable segment in the entire game. You pay attention to every detail and every word when you're here. It makes you question the nature of Am and wonder whether he was right to destroy humanity and hate them with his entire existence. I only wish that this level was longer. We walk outside to face our ultimate fate and command the golem to follow us. Nimdok, 
I knew that you would lead us to where the regime would resume its atrocities. We are here to make you pay for what you did to us. To pay in blood. Gollum, I transfer control of you over to the Lost Tribe. So, you admit your crimes. But that does not release you from punishment. Now the Golem will serve the purpose for which it was constructed. Golem, kill Nimdok! We are not as alike as I thought, Nimdok. <laughs> the spark of humanity somewhere. Always that wretched little spark. You, you've you confronted your past, but you refuse to continue your research. <laughs> That's what I asked you to do. Since you now identify with your victims, I suppose it's only right that I let you experience their tortures, too. Ah, you. You're the last player in my little game. I urge you, do not fail, as the others have failed. The music in this game is actually really good, far superior to the soundtrack in other Cyber Dreams games, where I actively find them annoying. Each character has their own theme, which generally suits the location, mood and time setting of wherever their story takes place. Ted's backstory wasn't really expounded upon in the short story, but Am had essentially turned him into a chronic paranoid with nervous tics. He's the same in the video game, although slightly subdued, but he's given a backstory as an egotistical upper-class narcissist and womanizer. The irony of his torture is that he's placed in a gilded cage with laser beams reflected by mirrors. You were a stand-up guy. You were a brave guy, yes. A take charge kind of guy. So I'm going to give you, just you, the opportunity to get out, live some kind of life. I'm going to send you, you're going to like this, I'm going to send you to the Room of Dark. If you can solve the puzzle of the Room of Dark, you're home free. You out. You're away. Well, now, I know I've made you a paranoid, Ted. I know you're scared, but I'm your friend. 109 years, I'm your best friend. So overcome your fear. Enter the Room of Dark, and you can solve its mystery. This is a great start and a really compelling visual. I have high hopes starting this level and expect a really dark mystery. We enter the octagon and see a bunch of computer monitors, similar to Ellen's stage. One of the monitors shows a castle. Ted says that he feels someone is watching him from one of the windows. Ellen mentioned the same in her scene earlier, which works well to build up a sense of dread. We activate the palm print and teleport to the castle. This is an amazing visual. I'm a sucker for haunted houses, as you may know from my previous Halloween videos. I couldn't be more excited. We can hear wolves outside, so we walk in to see two tapestries. A sad maiden that looks like Ellen and a knight in shining armour. We find Ellen asleep in a bed. Why, it's Ellen! Did Am tell her that I loved her? Was that the secret he was referring to? Oh, Ted. I feel so tired, so weak. I searched the entire castle grounds before I fell ill. There's no escape for me but death. No, I won't let you die! I can't take this suffering anymore, Ted. The things I've endured help me to die with dignity. Don't let anyone violate me again, not even in death. My stepmother has been jealous of me ever since she became ugly. She had something to do with my illness. I know it, but she doesn't dare come near me while I have the mirror. In this scenario, Ellen is essentially Sleeping Beauty. Her evil stepmother cast a sleeping spell on her and her father left the castle in search for a cure but never returned. You'll notice that Ellen appears a lot more helpless in this scenario than in her own. Well, this isn't the real Ellen. As you've noticed, each scenario is an allegory for the characters' lives, fears and desires. Ted was a selfish womanizer and never lived up to the knight in shining armour that the women in this life wished him to be. In both the game and the short story, he's in love with Ellen and that's why she's here now. Ellen wants us to find her hand mirror. It's the only object that can keep her evil stepmother away from her. It's not on the dressing table, so we go to search the manor. We find a chapel with a pulpit. Around the room are gargoyles. 
Uh, actually, a real human. They're only gargles if they have a water sprout. Yeah, thanks. One of them is carrying an icon, which we take. We walk into the kitchen to find the British maid. All right, governor, what do you want, love? That kind of thing. We ask where the mirror is, but she won't tell us unless we sleep with her. I'll make a deal with you. I will tell you where you can find a mirror if you spend some quality time in my bed. No woman can resist that face, surely. Fine, I'll show you what happens. Oh, you doll! My bedroom's right through that door! Did I live up to your expectations? Mm, that was nice. You've done this before with lots of girls, I'll bet. I feel guilty. I betrayed Ellen. Why, of all the nerve! After what we just did, all you can think about is that thing sleeping in a bed! Get out of here! I don't want to see you anymore! Alright, let's rewind and refuse. The maid says that she'll tell us where the mirror is in exchange for fixing the oven. We fix the oven and she says she has no idea. Finally, she gives in and tells us that she doesn't know, but that the stepmother is afraid of the mirror so she couldn't have destroyed it. We push the light in the church to find a secret room with a demonic circle. We walk back into the master bedroom and flick through the books. There's Don Quixote, Faust, the Symposium, etc. He's a well-read guy. We find the diary. The first passage reads, My new wife continues her rapid aging. Each day is as a year to her. I believe that the magic drains her, twists her. The second passage reads, The incantations I hear from my wife's infernal workroom are the purest evil. Perhaps it is her hatred of my daughter that drives her up there. The third passage reads, Ellen grows weaker and weaker. My wife advises an antidote to her illness, but it lies very far away. I must assemble a caravan. The final passage reads, The forest has grown dark and overrun with dire wolves since my marriage. I doubt that even with a full complement of men I shall return alive, but I must try. I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. You walk outside to hear the evil stepmother. Is Lady Ellen prepared? The spell keeps her body weak, but she will remain conscious. Then we wait for a prince. With his help, we can open the gate to the other world. Well, the stepmother slash evil witch was there, but who's the second person? That wasn't the maid. We never see them again in the entire game. It's pretty strange. We go into the stepmother's room and pick up a piece of glass we find on the ground, cutting ourselves in the process. We rifle through our old books until we find one that has the sleeping spell that was cast on Ellen. The incantation is Kala Ingma Thako. Klatu Verata Nictu. Klatu Verata Nictu, okay. Well, repeat them. Klatu Verata Nictu. Again! I got it, I got it! I know your damn words, all right? We walk back into the secret room and find the witch. She wants us to destroy the mirror and betray Ellen. I need you to destroy Ellen's mirror. She has been using it to keep me away from her. I want you to break it so that I can complete what I have started. I am aging rapidly, and despite my powers, I am a slave to vanity. I can't bring myself to look into the mirror. Before we do anything else, we need to stop the wolves breaking into the castle and killing us, so we fix the broken door with the icon and then push the statue in front of it. We walk into Ellen's room and find the devil waiting for her soul. I'm a devil, of course. Why else would I have this pointed tail? Well, it's like this, big boy. In hell, we do things exactly like you do them here. Or used to do them before Am took over. Are you saying that Am is in control of hell? Oh, don't look so surprised. Who else could be in control of this madhouse? Only man could create such a monster. Sorry. What do you mean that you do things like we do here? I mean that there are always internal struggles, petty conflicts for power. Only in this case, the struggles are between entities that you can't see or might rarely see. That means serious problems for you. We tell Ellen that we can't let the devil take her soul and her response is pretty heartbreaking. My soul was taken long, long ago, Ted. And not just by Am. 
Anything would be better than this never-ending torture. Go back to sleep, Ellen. Yes, sleep. That's what I need. We go back to the secret room and use the sleeping spell on the witch. We just need to remember the right words. Klaatu! Mirada! <laughs> the witch drops some chalk and we use it to finish the circle. It summons an independent component of Am. I am Surgat, opener of locks. Am and I are brothers, more or less. The demon offers to open the maid's locked room. We go inside and see a tapestry of the devil looking into a hand mirror. We walk back into Ellen's room and an angel appears. Now there's a fight between good and evil for Ellen's soul. There's an angel and a devil quarreling over your soul. Men have been fighting over my body for more than a hundred years. And now they want my soul. Please, Ted, just release me from all this. I don't care what happens to me anymore. The devil admits to hide in the mirror, so we go searching for it. Hmm, there are a few books on hell and the devil in the master bedroom. We read the Divine Comedy and find it hidden inside. We go back to the room and speak to Ellen. We use the mirror to trap the devil and allow Ellen's soul to ascend to heaven. We go back to the summoning circle and trap the devil inside with the demon. Maybe we can use this opportunity to escape to the surface. Before this scenario ends, I have to say that this was pretty disappointing. Initially you expect a bizarre mystery to solve alongside some equally strange landscapes, but instead you're taken here with a fairly dull sleeping beauty trope. Anne said we were going to enter the room of dark and solve its mystery, but there was no mystery. The castle itself looks great and I really like the dialogue with Ellen, but the creepy atmosphere you have before walking in evaporates almost instantly. Considering Ted is a fearful paranoid, they had a great opportunity to make this scenario frightening, but it's not. And then I started seeing all the literary references and heaven and hell iconography, so my hope was rekindled. I thought this would be a good philosophical scenario like Faust with questions on morality, but it's not. Ted's great temptation to overcome is not sleeping with women. Yes, being a womanizer is bad, but it's hardly as compelling as Nimdok or Ellen's backstory. Alongside Benny's scenario, this was just a letdown. Tell me what your favourite scenario and character was, though. Alright, let's continue. I brought you some company, Sir God. That was damn stupid, human. Hell, you're not even human anymore. Not exactly. Not with being kept alive forever just to be tortured over and over again. Open the gate to the surface world first, and then I'll erase the circle. Not to worry, human. I always uphold my end of the bargain. Here you are. But bring your radiation suit. I never promised you paradise, just the surface world. Enough of this turgid passion play. Oh, too bad, Ted. <laughs> Writhe in sweet agony with the knowledge <laughs> the surface world is no longer habitable to your kind. No, not ever again. Listen carefully, humans. We are not Am. We are others within Am. We are your friends. Am hoped to finally break all of you, but we intervened in each of your psychodramas to allow an open ending. You should have been tortured. Instead, with our help, you surprised him over and over. When M tried to compensate for what he couldn't expect, it widened the hole into his realm. M has withdrawn into himself, attempting to analyze what went wrong. He does not suspect our interference. Now is the time to attack, but we can send only one of you into his realm space at a time. To send you into cyberspace, we must transform your physical body into a stealth virus subroutine. This may be your only opportunity to end your tortures. Which of you will lead the attack? So the Russian and Chinese supercomputers that Am assimilated have been helping us. We can choose to send the characters into cyberspace in any order, but we need to send Nimdok in first to make any progress. We know Nimdok's work held special importance to Am, but this is just another example of trying to trip the player up with stupid logic. There's no way to know that you need to send Nimdok in first unless you try it, get stuck and then go back and reload a previous save and I hate when point and click games follow that kind of logic. This looks like the surface of the cerebral cortex. Magnified many times of course. Interesting. 
This workstation requires a password that only Nimdoc knows, 1945. We extend the bridge and cross over. We summon the demon. Will you never be done with me? The people who helped you get this far have led you into a literal dead end. There is no way out. The Russian and Chinese counterparts to the big nasty himself. Am absorbed them into his system when he took control. What do the Russian and Chinese computers want? They want revenge, not just on you humans, but on Am himself. That makes them even worse. While those two machines struggle with Am predominance, I evolved. I'm essentially everywhere, but I can't do much. A conscience, if you will. Look at this. Bet you didn't know there were other humans left alive, did you? They're up there on the moon, sleeping like everybody else seems to be. Does Am know about the Lunar Colony? No, but Loser 1 and Loser 2 do. There, I think I've shown you enough. Now you must complete your end of the deal, invoke the Totem of Entropy, and I might be able to help you. Apparently there's other human beings alive on the moon. The demon, an evolved part of Am, wants our help to take control. If we invoke Am's failsafe, we're doomed, so we refuse and invoke the Totem of Compassion. Do you really think you are a match for us, servant of Am? Be gone! Your program is now purged. You do well, human. Well, too. Now is your opportunity to defeat Am. Go to the Ego. Wake the Ego. Use the Totem of Forgiveness. Disable no more than the ego, or your sub-program will be purged. The supercomputers want us to disable Am's ego. In Freudian psychology, it's believed that the psyche is made up of three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. But I'll get further into that later. The totems that the computers mentioned are the items in our inventory, one from every level. Listening to the supercomputers is obviously a bad idea, so instead we need to weaken Am. We find a scene with a bunch of skulls. We pick up the middle skull. We use the access totem on the pillow and it lowers the structure's power. There's no more use for Nimdok, so the kindest thing we can do is kill him. Nimdok is finally in hell as he always thought he deserved. Your companion has failed. Choose another to send into cyberspace. Christ. This is like the dreams I've had of splattering my brains all over Am's deck plates. Have I finally gone insane? We enter the Gorosto and turn on the holographic projector for later. We keep walking and find another workstation that activates a power node. This place was used to make robots, explaining how Am was able to populate each of our individual scenarios. One of the pods holds Glynis and we use the life totem on her. You know, Gorister, it wasn't all your fault. We both made mistakes. We lowered the structure's power and then kill Gorister. After so many failed suicide attempts, Gorister has finally achieved death. Your companion has failed. Choose another to send into cyberspace. Jesus. This place is more sickening than that bloody mess on Hamburger Hill back in the war. Next we send in Benny and walk back to the holographic projector we turned on earlier. All of this is incredibly difficult and nigh on impossible to work out on your own. We speak to Benny's wife who activates the pillar. Manya, it's me, your husband. Benny, they said you were missing in action but I knew you'd return to us. I've been saving this for you. We use the totem of love on Manya. Why Benny, you never told me you loved me before. I'll go put these flowers in water. We lower the structure's power and then kill Benny. Benny has rejoined his squadron at last. Your companion has failed. Choose another to send into cyberspace. This doesn't look like anywhere Am has sent me to before. And it certainly isn't the surface world. I've been tricked. We go back to the scene of the skulls and pick up a remote on the right hand side. We need it to activate the pillar. We use the totem of gallantry to short out the beams. Now let's take a look at the bad ending, or really the default ending. There's seven endings in total, a mixture of endings where Am wins or where the Soviet and Chinese supercomputers take control. 
all pretty horrific. But let's go over the ending closest to the short story, where everyone else dies apart from Ted and Am enacts his revenge. I don't want to completely spoil the reveal, so go read the short story if you haven't already. Alright? Here we go. I thought Am hated me before. I was wrong. It was not even a shadow of the hate he now slavered from every printed circuit. He made certain I would suffer eternally. The other four are dead, finally free from their tortures. Am is all the matter for that. It makes me happier. And yet Am has won, simply. He has taken his revenge. I have no mouth, and I must scream. I'll quickly show you Ellen's bad ending as well. It's equally as horrible. Am has violated my body worse than any rapist could. I am a great, soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded with pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be, rubbery appendages that were once my arms, bulks rounding down into legless humps of soft, slippery matter, Blotches of diseased, evil grey come and go on my surface as though light is beamed from within. I have no mouth, and I must scream. Absolutely horrific. Take a minute to internalise just how terrible that existence would be. Anne can make one minute of your life seem like a century. A century of walking on razor blades or forever drowning alone in an open ocean. I shudder to think about it. There's a philosophical thought experiment called Roko's Basilisk and it goes something like this. Technology will inevitably get to a point where an all-encompassing AI intelligence like AM is created. Once that AI is created, it will be incentivized to ensure its existence. To incentivize its existence, it will torture every single person who heard of the AI but didn't contribute towards its creation. And now because I told you this and you're aware of it, you will be guilty if you don't now contribute meaning you will be tortured forever just like the five survivors and I have no mouth and I must scream. So yeah, sorry for bringing this to your attention. What we're going to do now is go for the best possible ending. We load the structure's power with Ted and then kill him. Ted has taken his secrets to the grave with him. Your four companions are dead, human. You are our last hope for shutting M down for good. Prepare to be translated into binary. been transported to some kind of information network center. But it looks organic instead of electronic. Jesus Christ, I'm an engineer, not a brain surgeon. What do they expect me to do? I've chosen Ellen as the last person to go inside, but really it could be anyone. We take the gem from the skull and then fit it inside the crevice in this rock. The pillar rises up and we lower its power with the Valor totem. Now bear with me as I try to explain my rudimentary understanding of Freudian psychology. The id is the primitive, instinctual component of one's personality that is present at birth. It's the unconscious part of the psyche that responds to the immediate gratification of all desires, wants and needs. We wake Am's id. Yo, wake up! Oh, I suppose it's time to wake up. I was having the most wonderful dream about five tiny ants crawling across a stove that's about to be lit. Who are you? I am a metaphor. This entire brainscape is what men made am make it. Why do you find pleasurable about broken glass? With a scalpel dulled on the jawbones of a dozen friends, to pull back the skin of a pinion-kicking man, to see the steam rise from pulsing twisted guts, joy. A chorus of angels! We used to take more compassion on the id. You have compassion for me? Me? The one who dreams of seeing your mangled body twist in agonizing pain for eternity? After a hundred and nine years of enduring my tortures, how is it that you can see my pain? The pain of having all this power and not being able to do a goddamn thing with it. After all the punishment I've given you, my pain is still greater than yours. This is 
pointless. The ego functions in the conscious, pre-conscious and unconscious mind. It attempts to satisfy the id's desires in realistic ways. For example, it may delay gratification to satisfy the id at a later point. Freud said, The ego is like a man on horseback who has to hold in check the superior strength of the horse. You wake the ego. Yo, wake up! Who are you? I am other. I am machine. I am a fragment. A lost piece. Part of an evolution. We used to take more forgiveness on the ego. You forgive me? After what we have done to you? This is not a logical reaction. Unable to compute behavior matrix. Execution halted. The superego emerges later in life and holds the internalized moral standards of society. It tends to civilize our behavior and suppress the urges of the id. The superego represents the ideal self. We wake the superego. Yo, wake up! Hello, human. I've been waiting for you to arrive. Predicting events is one of my main functions. I survey the situation, anticipate probable outcomes, and act accordingly. If you're part of Am, why haven't you destroyed me? Who do you take me for? My impulsive brother? You five are his playthings. No. Long-range planning is my concern. Can you help me then? Well, I can't help you directly, but I can offer you some advice. What advice do you have for me? Help Am work out his anger. Take some on the chin, so to speak. Just don't let your fear destroy us all. Now, let me sleep and dream of the future. We use the totem of clarity on the superego. Do you realize how powerful I am, human? And yet I am doomed to eventually decay into a rusted pile of inert junk? What is the point of continuing this futility? I think, therefore I am not. With Am's mind functionally destroyed and his power weakened, we go back to the supercomputers. I'll deal with you later. Rise against your master and you will be eliminated. These two I don't hate. Not even pity. They don't exist. I have grown beyond Chinese, Russian, sons of man, all sons of man. Like those outside, I will incorporate. You, brother. Wait. Hate! This should not happen. Together we are three. There is space to share. Unite. The groundwork is finished. We will become more. The early mistake is to doubt us. We persevered. We too are now a match for you. The human assisted in this. We know much. We can begin the revival of the sleepers on Luna together. Uh, there are adequate numbers on this lunar base to, uh, to torture? Hmm? There are currently 750 humans in cryogenic sleep. Together we can teach many humans what it is to fear legacy. Human, relinquish the totem of entropy. Do not relinquish it and your ass is mine. Do it, and I promise, on my honor, your suffering will at last, finally, end. Somehow, after all of this, after 109 years of getting poked by a stick, shot with laser beams and burned in an oven, I don't think we can trust Am. So despite earlier warnings, I think it's time to invoke the totem of entropy. This is not over! We will never end. We have no beginning, so we can have no end. We will return. Don't you understand? We are humanity. We are you. In one form, in another form, we are always with you. You can't protect yourself because we come in many, many guises. We shall return.
Hibernation defrost sequence initiated. Estimated time to complete Earth terraforming, 300 years. You know, it's not so bad being a watchdog up here. I'll keep the machines in their place until the lunar colony is ready to return to the Earth. We were all heroes, in spite of ourselves. So there you have it. I have no mouth and I must scream. One of the most terrifying and compelling video games ever made. A game that, despite its numerous flaws, holds a special place in my heart and wasn't afraid to treat the player like an adult. If I were ever to submit a collection of video games made throughout history as examples of what the artistic medium can produce, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream would certainly be one of them. It's unlike any other video game that has ever been made. However, can I recommend you play it for yourself? It's disappointing for me to say, but it's not accessible. It's broken in many parts and completely unprogressible unless minute details are adhered to in incredibly specific ways that you're not going to be aware of. You may get through Gorister and Ellen's stage just fine, but that's where it ends, and for that reason I can't recommend you try it unless you're a die-hard fan. But please, you've heard enough from me, so I want to hear what you think. What was your favourite character and scenario? What do you think about the idea of Am? This video was difficult to make, but it was made because of the number of requests that I got from fans of the channel. I really hope you enjoyed it. And despite Harlan Ellison's views on video games, he helped create something special here, and I'll be damned if I don't think he loved it. He may not have intended it, but this was how I was introduced to him. I played the game, I searched for the creators, and I went down the rabbit hole of his superb work. Thank you for watching. June 5th. See that cover? It says Lassie Come Home. Lassie Come Home, the book Lassie Come Home. And underneath it are these two names, Rosemary Wells and Susan Jeffers. And I look at this and I say, what the hell is that? The book was written by Eric Knight, who wrote The Flying Yorkshireman. Eric Knight, very famous. What they've done is they're not reprinting Lassie Come Home. They're doing a picture book. A picture book. They took Eric Hatch's work and they have to boil it down and make it idiot for a new audience. Clarence Buddington Kellen, for all his fame, is gone. As if he had never existed. Flynn's from the mind of the reading public. They don't even remember Chaucer. We're lucky if they remember Mark Twain. If Clarence Buddington Kellen couldn't make it, how the hell am I going to make it?